Welcome everyone to what we consider to be um, a pretty groundbreaking webinar. Um, it's really the culmination of the last years, almost a year and a half actually, of work that the Construction Progress Coalition was putting forth in having virtual roundtables monthly, addressing some of the shared pains that we um, experience in the construction industry. And this roundtable um, around mental health really kind of sprung out of um, an inclusion and diversity roundtable, which uh, Nathan tapped me on the shoulder to ask me to, to kick off, uh, especially in light of a lot of the um, experiences we were all experiencing, especially with George Floyd's murder in the beginning part of our uh, middle part of last year. And it very quickly, we started to realize that conversations around inclusion and diversity really start at a, almost a neurological level and impact uh, mental health. And so uh, we were um, lucky enough to be able to break out an, an entirely separate roundtable solely focused on mental health. And I am honored to sit in and help lead, guide this discussion. By no means, uh, I am not the expert here. I am really the Sherpa for us as we hear from experts and other peers, uh, our peers in industry to really talk about this important topic. So I wanted to first kick off by introducing you to um, some of our mental health ambassadors is what we're going to call them. Um, I, I would love to introduce you first to Cal Byer, named one of the top 25 newsmakers for 2016 by ENR with work in suicide prevention, served on the Lived Experience Advisory Committee for Suicide Prevention Resource Center, peer editor since 2018 for construction executive online mental health and has authored over 80 articles on mental health, substance abuse, addiction treatment and recovery, um, suicide prevention and well-being. And he's done numerous presentations, well over 300, and has been a staple for us uh, at the CPC as we are navigating these conversations. So Cal, I, I want to first kick it off with you and, and start with a question. Um, I'd love for you to walk us through um, what CIASP is, um, define that acronym for us, how did it get started, and how has the conversation around suicide prevention really changed since the start of that initiative? Thank you very much, Sasha. Great introduction. Really excited to be here today. This has been an incredible journey. For me, the journey started before Hurricane Katrina in the uh, aftermath of 9-11. Uh, and mental health was a topic that was not comfortable to talk about in the workplace, but yet it was one that was very important. Many of our industry respond in times of crisis and are exposed to a lot of traumatic events. And um, I'm very, very fortunate in 2010, was appointed to the National Action Alliance for Suicide Prevention. And that's the country's public-private partnership, which now has over 250 different stakeholders. I was uh, appointed to represent the workplace and then chose to wear my boots um, and hard hat representing construction. Um, we started a construction subcommittee just a year after. And then I ultimately, in 2014, went to work for a contractor. I felt like if I worked for a company, I would have a better chance advocating on behalf of these topics. The Construction Industry Alliance for Suicide Prevention was formed in the fall of 2016 by the Construction Financial Management Association. They published the first real article on this topic in uh, November of 2015. It was a lonely six years. The first article that referenced suicide that we're aware of was in 2009, also Building Profits, which was Construction Financial Management Association. And the topic was crisis management, the critical human element. It was supposed to be a three-part series. Part two was gonna be psychological safety. Part three was going to be suicide prevention. And despite the popularity of that article, Sasha, no one wanted to publish part two or part three. It showed stigma and taboo really interfered with the, the topic. So I went to work for the contractor, 2015, there was no data. And um, the data didn't come out by the construction, uh, I'm sorry, the CPC, the, the, the Centers for Disease Control until July of 2016. 
So we were talking about risk factors. We were applying risk management to public health concern of suicide. And what I would say is we were generally acknowledged to be 15 years behind the UK and Australia construction industries. In the UK, there was a program called Mates in Mind, largely modeled after the Australian program, Mates in Construction. Mm -hmm. And the Construction Industry Alliance for Suicide Prevention was to be a one-stop shop, a place, a repository, we could load information and make uh, general information available. So the dialogue has changed pretty significantly. I'll do this as timely as uh, possible, but there are a lot of cultural clues that have been uh, laid like breadcrumbs. You can see the ongoing evolution. I pinch myself when I see how far we've come in the last uh, seven years. A big shout out to the CPC for your virtual monthly roundtables. You've generated a lot of dialogue. You've expanded the range of topics. I mean, it's been incredible to see the topics you, Nathan, Bianca, Jeff Sample, Chad have been leading. And it's been really the forefront of technology. So not surprising that you would be the innovators uh, that have really popularized a lot of these topics. Since November 1st of 2015, well over 250 different articles by a range of authors, many different publications. And almost every industry association and labor union has had presentations on these topics of mental health and suicide prevention. The thing that I'm probably most pleased with is we responded with suicide prevention as the next frontier in safety, but it was still hard to get companies to talk about mental health and then really almost impossible to get companies willing to talk about substance misuse. And we've done both. So all the elephants are um, talked about, we've uh, got them uh, being addressed. And I would say a couple of things, AGC and their culture of care program, ABC, Associated Builders and Contractors, Total Human Health, and in 2021, National Construction Safety Week talked about committed to holistic safety. The first time we've bridged physical and mental health in one topic to focus on eliminating the distractions that lead to workplace injuries, quality defects, idle equipment, all the things that impact profitability of construction uh, job sites. The last thing to just really mention, this montage that Nathan has on the screen was in the feature covered story for engineering news record. They did the feature on the print edition on August 3rd and uh, the digital edition, edition was July 29th. The online version was nine pages of stories of various leaders in different segments of our industry. And it covered mental health, suicide prevention, substance misuse, and addiction treatment and recovery. The conversation has changed from taboo and fear to one of education and empowerment. And really excited to see and hear from the panel that's been assembled today. So Sasha, your company has been uh, very instrumental as well. The topics that you're providing in terms of well-being, that's the last dimension that we wanted to mention today. We've gone from the mental health to well-being holistically addressing the gamut of factors upstream that uh, contribute to overall mental and physical well-being of workers and families. So I know it's a lot. It's um, a 20-year condensed version of how the dialogue has changed, and i um, really excited to hear from the panelists. Yeah, thank you so much. I think it's... Um, uh, it's amazing the journey that we've experienced thus far in such a short amount of time. And I think those of us who are technology evangelists are very keenly aware of external factors that create compelling events to create seismic shifts and changes in behavior. And not unlike how this happens, both from a digital transformation perspective, what we're really seeing is this is an internal transformation that's happening more along the lines of culture. Um, and 
from a performance standpoint, really kind of um, understanding ourselves better in order to lead ourselves and others even better. Um, Nathan talked about from grit to great. This is not an easy transition for an industry like construction to make. So I'm really honored to partner with this group of individuals to uh, have this conversation and reflect on how much uh, forward momentum we've created thus far. Um, Cal, I, I'd love it if you could introduce our next subject matter expert for me. Jim um, is, is joining us today. I just got introduced to him uh, on a pre-call, um, but thank you for bringing him to our attention. Would you mind introducing him for us? Yeah, Jim is a new friend. I met him through the United Brotherhood of Carpenters and Joiners. He works in their training academy in Las Vegas, which is generally acknowledged to be premier state-of-the-art, technology-enabled. Jim is a career-long instructional designer, facilitator, and uh, speaker extraordinary. Speaks from the heart. He's gifted. He has passion. And um, I'm collaborating with him right now on a program that the Carpenters has undertaken around worker well-being. So, Jim, uh, happy to see you today. Glad you Great could join us and uh, share some of your story with us as well. Sure. So I work for the United Brotherhood of Carpenters and Joiners, as Cal said, and I started with them in 2016 as an instructor, as a designer, and I also work with our e-learning platform. So I work with the LMS and the courses we developed there. Well, in recent months, there have been many more discussions about health. And when the construction folks look at health, a lot of it is physical health. We think health, we think, oh, we've got to keep you physically healthy on the job sites and safe and that kind of thing. But we're taking a little different approach to how Cal explained things. We're actually taking it from a wellness approach. And so I'm actually developing an online program that all of our members, and we have over 500,000 members, all of our members are going to be invited to take this program We've decided to do it as a self-paced e-learning module because of the personal nature of the content as well, but we're also gonna supply resources. So we're gonna look at the wellness of the individual on a number of different scopes, more than just physical wellness, but we're gonna look at emotional wellness and spiritual and social and financial and also physical. And so, we're going to look at six different areas of wellness and also provide some insights, perspectives, and information regarding suicide prevention as well. And that is a tough topic for a lot of people because I think on some level, and I, I can even speak to this personally, on some level, I think each one of us either knows of somebody or has had an experience that someone we know knows somebody, you know, that kind of thing. None of us is too far removed from that unfortunate element in our society. And so to include that in this course is at times a little overwhelming because to just get the verbiage right and to get the approach right as, as to, hey, look, you know, it's, we talk about safety, it's safe to be able to explore this topic and talk about this. And so to package this together in a way that people are gonna feel comfortable, not only examining where they're at, but also being willing to reach out for help or to help somebody else who may need help because they see some warning signs. It's gonna really change, I believe, it's really gonna change how our membership looks at health as more than just a physical thing, but to look at it really holistically to say, let's look at wellness and prevention from uh, substance misuse and uh, from risk of suicide and things like this as well. So I'm really honored to be a part of this panel. I'll talk a little more about my background and some of what puts me here as well a little bit later on. But from the UBC's perspective, we're very excited to get our membership on board with looking at wellness in a different way. Oh, thank you. Honestly, thank you. Thank you for your leadership there. Um, this is 
this is an area where um, many hands make the work a bit lighter. <laughs> and in order to destigmatize, we need to have practical tools to um, engage in that conversation and really start the conversation. Um, which really brings me to our next um, ambassador, Chad Pearson. Chad is the normal moderator for these monthly mental health um, roundtables, but we could not let him facilitate today because the story, his personal story, as well as the work he does is so impactful to this conversation. We wanted him in the seat, <laughs> uh, in the seat with us in order to be able to um, support the conversation and not just facilitate it. And so I think one of the things that we're all keenly aware of is, um, is around the role that stress has when it comes to mental health. Construction is probably one of the most stressful, um, nuanced uh, industries when it comes to managing uh, conflict, um, res conflict resolution, um, and just uh, being at the mercy of deadlines, timelines, budgets, all things that are really out of our control, um, which makes it such a unique uh, industry to have a conversation around um, mental health. So Chad, I, I wanted to introduce you now and, and as someone who is really actively driving business, I know that for your day job, you you know, for a subcontract at ERP software solution company, I really want to kind of understand um, how are you finding time and energy to focus so much on the mental health uh, training and awareness, number one, and two, um, Share with us, if you can, some of the lessons that you've learned as moderator. How is that playing into forming your perspective around mental health? Oh, man. Well, OK, so on your first question there, where do I find the time? Um, it's it's actually inbred in what we do. So we at our own company, we we build everything around performance positivity, physical and mental health, because really the brain is at the center of everything that we do. So when you prioritize the um, cognitive function and health of the brain, we do it two ways with um, at a tactical level with tactics that help us perform better while simultaneously improving positivity and physical and mental health. And then we do it through the environment that we work in. You know, it's, 30% of your life that you, you spend in your working life. So that's why we prioritize that environment. Um, so it's not really about the finding the time. It's we are literally living and breathing it every day and constantly trying to improve the processes and tactics that we use to improve those three areas, performance, positivity, and physical and mental health. Um, the moderating these sessions has been an exceptional experience because I, with my background, I came from a uh, combat arts background that transitioned into police work. I had a, a formally trained in crisis resolution and sociology with Bachelor of Arts. And then I made it in a contact uh, a construction technology. So with my background, I had a very, while I had lots of experiences uh, in crisis resolution and a lot of successes and pra the practical application of uh, lessons that I had learned, when I got involved in moderating these mental health sessions, it opened my eyes to a whole diverse set of perspectives that started to shift even things that we were doing at Plexus with our own course. And when I say course, we have a, a seven week internal training course where we focus on um, you know, improving the leadership uh, and the performance positivity, and, uh, physical and mental health of employees. And the, the course has even shifted from the in intelligence and experiences of the people that I've met in these sessions. So it's been amazing. And I see they have Darcy up here and she is one of them. <laughs> that is, uh, uh, you know, speak of the devil. Uh, we, we really wish she was here today, but she couldn't. Um, and and uh, she had a, a, a big impact on the course as well. Now, I guess uh, you know, I'm going to kind of touch on some of the stuff that Darcy really brought in, which was uh, her perspective on burnout. And the one thing that sticks out mostly about what she said was when she described or gave us the definition of burnout, which as you can see is right on the screen here. It's a syndrome resulting from chronic workplace stress that is not successfully managed. And she brought up a, a, a very noteworthy perspective here. She wasn't too keen on the last part of that, which says that is not successfully managed because it puts, it suggests that the onus is on the individual to manage it properly. 
And this struck me because she's 100% right. There is an onus on the organization to be attentive, attentive to make sure that they are not putting people in compromising positions where they are going to get to the extreme levels of stress, which leads to the chronic disease and the factors that you now see in front of you. Uh, I, th this, this graph is also known as the yerkes dodson law. It's something that we use to train uh, people internally as well. There's always a point of failure in any tactic. And stress can be a tactic. We actually use it in training where we purposefully induce uh, stress. Sometimes we even use triggers on purpose and we do that to create a hormone or a, a, a hormetic effect on uh, the person to, con to, to control, build strength in a controlled fashion. Now, <clears throat> when, when Darcy mentioned that, it, uh, it reminded me of a perspective that we use called the serve and protect mindset for leaders. And the serve and protect mindset just simply means that as leaders, we serve the team by providing everything they need, not want, everything they need to succeed, and you protect the team by protecting them from harmful behaviors. And sometimes that actually means being a tough leader, but it takes a lot of attention and effort to continuously pay attention to your team and look for these signs of stress and the symptoms that they're reaching or getting close to that point of failure. And I'm gonna describe this uh, slide here and it was, it could not have worked out better when we came on to the practice session before this webinar, Nathan, he apologized for being flustered and he wiped his forehead because he was sweating. He said, man, talk about burnout. I think I'm getting there. And I asked him what his symptoms were and he's like, I'm sweating, anxious, and I got a headache. Well, hold the door, cause listen to this. <clears throat> So when, whenever you pursue outcomes, a lot of the times people will be so hyper-focused on outcomes, targets, goals, and yes, you have to set goals. But if you've ever seen a sales rep on day one when they get hired and then you look at them and uh, after year one and year two, they are probably the suffering the impact of ongoing chronic prolonged stress, which is a direct um, it, it, it's, it starts with epinephrine in the brain. Epinephrine is, uh, you know, helps you get alert, it gives you energy, and it actually improves brain function. And anytime you put effort into something, it doesn't matter what you're doing. If you're getting up off the couch, you're getting a little bit of epinephrine. Every time that you're chasing something, a little bit of epinephrine, anything that needs action. And it's there for a very good reason. Now, prolonged action means prolonged effort. It will continuously, in, the brain will continuously draw ep epinephrine and your brain, your brain will be flooded with epinephrine. And once you reach that point of failure, you will start to sweat. Your heart rate will go up. You'll get a headache. All the symptoms, the anxious, that's a, when you see people uh, throwing up their arms and they're getting frustrated, you will eventually quit. And this is where grit can be a bad thing, where you constantly push through and you suffer the impact of excessive epinephrine. So on the good side, it improves positivity, performance, physical and mental health, but then you reach the point of failure and it starts to hurt. And that's the red squares that you see. Now, moving on to the next slide, what, what would have uh, helped Nathan here <clears throat> is, um, actually, I'm gonna backtrack a bit. Jim has a book and uh, what was the title? Um, uh, yes, look where you are and see where you're going. So when I saw this, I was laughing. So go back to the other slide there. Navigation, we call it navigation and reflection. When, when you are pursuing an outcome, it requires effort, which increases epinephrine. When you focus on the effort towards the outcome and take those breaks to reflect and navigate, you are reflecting to see where you are and you are navigating to validate the fact that you are on the right path. That rewards your brain with dopamine and dopamine is a buffer to epinephrine. So if you got that point of failure in the yerkes dodson law and epinephrine is approaching that point of failure, the dopamine buffers it. 
So that is a key when you're, uh, you know, back when going back to combat sports and putting in the amount of effort that was required to become, you know, uh, to perform at an elite level, but simultaneously love it and keep that smile on your face, go through a whole day and simultaneously love the experience and feel satisfied. You need that navigation and reflection. So one of the tools that we do uh, or that we use in uh, Plexus. So, so we call this my day. Uh, I blacked out some of the information here because it's uh, personal, but we started using this with leaders and then we brought it out after we find it and um, we're bringing on all employees now. But as you get more responsibility in your workday, things like this become more important. And it's very simple. You're putting in a lot of effort into the plan throughout the day but then you reflect and navigate three or four times a day to make sure that you are getting that dopamine release, buffering the norepinephrine as you go on. And later on in this uh, presentation, you're gonna hear about imposter syndrome and the inner critic. And the reason why we digitize this and make sure that there's a documented history of it is because as you go through your day navigating and reflecting, you're not only you know, preventing the excessive epinephrine, but you actually have a full documented history that both the person can use as they get more control over their day and satisfaction out of their day. But there are two coaches. There's always two coaches that will look at this and look for patterns and stress. And it, it's, it helps you win that debate that you'll have with your own inner critic as times come up. So a really good story about this. Um, these things don't always work by themselves. It still requires attentive leadership. And three weeks ago, one of our uh, one of our all stars, Brian Alexander, he's on a um, he is on a, uh, a a high pressure project. I noticed at the end of the Monday, he had signs of excessive epinephrine. He's doing my day every day, but at the end of this Monday, I could see it in his eyes, and I could see him sweating, and he was frustrated. That's all right. Sometimes that happens. Tuesday, I recognize the same thing. Wednesday, I saw the same thing when I was saying goodbye to him. So on my drive home, I called his direct uh, supervisor, Jenny, and I was like, hey, Jenny, um, I think we need to have a little talk with Brian, make sure that he's okay. Jenny said, good timing. He literally just raised the flag. So uh, raising the flag at our company means if you need your assistance, you raise a flag and we kick in. Uh, some help. So we rally, help you out, make sure that you're okay. So anyways, it was just, it was neat because three days I saw the pattern, even though he was using my day, he was still putting so much pressure on having a positive outcome on this project that he still uh, suffered the impact of um, excessive epinephrine. And over time, the excessive epinephrine is what leads to heart disease, you know, um, the thickening of blood vessels, high pressure, uh, weight gain, it's uh, chronic insomnia, so it has long-term disastrous effects. I feel like, <laughs> Chad, I feel like we literally just need almost uh, ca to capture that uh, almost as a module for learning and understanding the signs, um, the ways of, of raising the flag or of recognizing in another and approaching that conversation. Um, mo mainly because we are such we have such performance driven uh, outcomes that we expect to do in this industry. So that I, I found myself taking notes as you were talking. Uh, thank you for that. I think that's that was a lot to take in, but gives us a different way and a different uh, way of kind of looking at that. Mm. Um, I, I wanted to to go next and um, introduce our, our next ambassador um, to this conversation um, who if you've if you've not had the chance to um, listen to or hear we've had him on the roundtables here as well um, but really bring in Brent Darnell here because we want to start looking at okay we have an understanding now of how to recognize some of these signs but really want to start looking at um, how are we measuring how do we assess and measure and so I wanted to take a step back Brent and have you come in and really start to unpack the question of what are the early signs or symptoms 
of stress and burnout. And for those who, who aren't aware of the immense uh, in-depth work that you do around emotional intelligence, specifically in construction, um, talk us through how do we create those critical first steps of self-awareness to then measure and understand the early symptoms of stress and burnout? Yeah, this uh, and we have an evaluation that we're gonna give everybody. Uh, it'll be on the in the links at the end where you can take an evaluation. Now, this is not a mental health assessment. It's not, a, it's not meant to diagnose any mental or physical disease, but we sort of back it up a few steps. And if we can catch this early, uh, we can take some, do some interventions and take some steps into modifying lifestyle, increasing self-awareness so that you know what these symptoms are. But we basically, we, we have a, an emotional evaluation that measures 16 different emotional competencies. And we look at six to indicate burnout. We look at self-regard because when you're in burnout and starting down that road, you feel bad about yourself. You may not, you may ha have some behaviors you're not liking that you beat yourself up about. You may gain some weight. So self-regard usually goes down a little bit. Then we look at self-actualization. Do you have purpose and meaning in your life? Is that gone out of your life? That's a great indicator of burnout. And then we look at relationships because if you're in burnout, usually you're pretty exhausted most of the time and you don't have the energy for relationships to cultivate and maintain them. So well, we look at relationships. And then we also look at uh, stress tolerance, which is obvious. How well do you tolerate stress and manage your stress? And then we look at optimism and happiness, happiness more of a present state, optimism more of a future state. We've added also this test that you can take a physical survey based on physical symptoms, and that will indicate some burnout uh, physical systems in your body as well, things like adrenals. If your adrenals are fried and you're pumping out adrenaline and cortisol, you know, your adrenals are gonna show up in this physical survey. And then we have parasympathetic dominance and sympathetic dominance. Well, sympathetic dominance is your fight or flight. If you're in fight or flight all the time and you're pumping out adrenaline and cortisol all the time, it's just like Chad said, you're gonna get into this state where you're just making bad decisions and you, you it, it's just this cliff that you fall off. And then the uh, parasympathetic dominance is, is the rest side or the exhaustion side. And we're seeing a lot more burnout in the industry. We're seeing a lot more of the physical signs of that. Uh, we also see sometimes people score really well in, this, in the emotional part, but we call it racing toward burnout, where you have physical symptoms of stress like trouble sleeping or aches and pains, headaches, other kinds of pains, stomach issues, digestion issues, fatigue. All of those can be symptoms of stress, right? So um, this guy, this is Dennis. Uh, it, you can see the before scores in this emotional profile. It, it's incredible because 100 is the mean. It's just like an IQ test. So 100 is the bell curve, top of the bell curve, the average. Look where he was with, with these areas, especially those areas I mentioned, they're extremely low. Um, happiness, self-actualization. Uh, so we, we, we recognize right away, Dennis was in total utter burnout and uh, we started with his, we started with self-awareness and becoming more aware of when he was feeling exhausted or tired and when he was making those decisions that, that aren't really good decisions. And then from there, we worked on his stress management and stress tolerance and taught things, you know, like we teach meditation techniques and breathing techniques and mindfulness techniques. And uh, you can see the after scores. Now, let me just put this in perspective. The statisticians that talk to me about these, these before and afters, they tell me that a five point differential indicates a shift in behavior. Well, look at these, look at these shifts. They're 30 plus points on, on some of these. So this is an entirely different human being. And it, there's, a, there's a video of Dennis and he talks about this journey of going through this. Um, do we have that? Do we have the video? Can we play it? We, it, it, it we'll put it the link in. We have it from our past round table. So we'll, okay. we'll, everyone will be able to watch it in the link. Uh, to the Excellent. So watch this, this, this story because... The really coolest part for me on Dennis's story is he said, I was in this course and I didn't know what I was doing here. I had a job to do. 
And I had to take days off to come do this stupid course. And he didn't, he didn't think, he didn't see the value. But the after on him, he says he, he knew he was depressed. He knew he was down this bad road. Uh, it was in black and white on a, on a test that we gave him and the results. And then we gave him some real practical tools to change that dynamic. And it changed his life. I mean, on this job, he was working probably 80 hour weeks. He was smoking two packs of cigarettes a day. He was eating crappy food. He wasn't sleeping well. And all of the courses, leadership courses we do talk a lot about nutrition and stress and sleep and uh, exercise and how you manage all those things, lifestyle choices, you know, we, and not to tell people how to live their lives, but show them the consequences of the choices that they're making and give them the resources to be able to help with those things that are, that are tearing them down so badly. And, you know, my, my, big goal for the industry is to have people work in this industry for 30, 40 years and retire healthy and full of vigor and retire, um, you know, full of health so that you can enjoy your retirement. And, and we just don't have that. Uh, there's a, uh, I have my book. In fact, I'll give everybody my book as well. If you, and Nathan, you might have to add this at the end, but it's just brentdarnell.com forward slash hmm, forward slash people profit and they can just download this book and there's a chapter in there on safety and there's a chapter in there on stress and burnout as well um so that's that's my uh uh i, I i'm honored to be part of this you know people like chad and cal and and bianca and uh, Nathan and, and Sasha, you guys are really carrying the flag on this and, and it's much appreciated. The industry needs it. And we're glad that you are all here. Well, thank you, Brent, for the work that you're doing. Um, the generosity um, that we've experienced from you, even just now offering your book as a free download, I think that goes to speak to how all of us recognize this is a no-brainer. Uh, this is not something we should be competing on. This is something we should be really linking arms to help uh, create clear paths to start the conversation um, because this will not happen in a vacuum. Uh, so Brent, thank you so much. We appreciate your expertise and the work that you've done and the tools that you're giving us. So at this stage, we, we wanna pivot the conversation um, I hope you've taken notes and there's links being put in the chat. So even if you're watching this back on demand, you should be able to access those links. We'll also reference all the links at the end. Um, but there are plenty of tools to get you started. Um, and if you're anything like me, you're having aha moments, even as a moderator, I'm checking myself <laughs> and recognizing, oh, wow, I did not. I did not think of it in those terms in recognizing burnout and other uh, other components. So hopefully you are as well. Um, but I really want to shift now to um, hearing from what I consider to be three really key thought leaders in industry, three individuals who um, I follow on social media, I work with, uh, have had the opportunity to work with in, thought, uh, in regards to thought leadership. Um, but it really nobody, nobody is, there's no heroes in this uh, industry of construction and there are no Ironmen in the sense of if you kill yourself to get the work done, um, it, it's not to be celebrated. We all need mental and physical breaks. Um, grit is good. It, it's what's enabled us to use brute force to get work done, but it's clear now it's not great especially as we move into an age where technology plays such a more of an important role, where we're able to gather more data in order to make sense and create insights and make decisions based on insights rather than gut reaction or brute force or who yells the loudest, to be frank. Um, really being, being a high performer in this industry uh, is going to rely on your emotional intelligence and your ability to know yourself, which includes knowing when to pull back, knowing when you're racing towards burnout. Uh, our, our employers need the best from us. And although the former model was really through brute force and grit, 
we're now at an opportunity where we can work in serial, we can work remote technologies enabling us to not have to be in the physical same place. So we have the opportunity to truly have more control over how we're getting work done. And I want to pivot now to um, the three thought leaders who first and start off by saying thank you to each of them for being brave enough to share their stories with us. Um, really destigmatization does it's not a, a switch you can flip. It really starts with brave individuals who are vulnerable um, and sharing their stories. Uh, and it's it's not just men <laughs> that that are uh, guilty of this. It really truly are high performers. So we wanted to start this conversation, uh, Brittany. I wanted to welcome you, <laughs> welcome you in, Brittany. If you're not familiar, please Google uh, her podcast. Google her. She is one of the early AEC thought leaders uh, who really went on the record and opened up around mental health. Uh, and mental, her own mental health, how um, experiences within the industry has impacted her mental health. And uh, episode 14 of her Constructure podcast, she really shared openly and honestly and looked at the components of burnout from that first person perspective, which I don't even know if I'm brave enough to do that, Brittany, so my hat is off to you for doing that. But I'd love for you to share your story with us and, and really tell us why was it important to you to share those personal reflections essentially with your world. Um, and uh, what is what is your experience now versus then, the state of mind you're in then? I'd love for you to share that with us. Oh man, I'm just really excited to dig into this topic. Um, not because it's not hard, it is hard. Um, every single time and similar to you, Sasha, I I'm always reflecting when I'm listening to, you know, of course, the, the, the ambassadors that are sharing the science and the background of to, as to why we experience what we experience. But to share a little bit about my story, this must have been, what, 2016, so some years ago, um, I had been working as an owner's rep. Um, now I'm at an owner organization, um, but I, I was very heavily um, working at that, at that company and just easily 50 hours a week um, working on that particular role. But I had um, also been working to develop this podcast because while um, working, I had, I had identified that there's people doing great things in the industry that I wanted to learn from. So I said, let me go ahead and, and start this podcast in order to figure out an avenue to meet these individuals that are doing things that are great. And that's really how the Constructor podcast was, was born. Um, but the volume of, of work and then also the uncertainty of kind of embarking into this path of the unknown and putting content out there, it was really, really scary for me as an introvert. Um, and yes, even though people are on social media and out there, like it's still very okay to consider yourself an introvert because it's about recovery. It's about making sure you have that time to take care of oneself. I did not know that I needed that at that time. It's so funny, Chad was talking about uh, navigating and, and reflecting. I was not doing any of that whatsoever. Um, I didn't know that that's what I needed. But so what's, what's interesting is I was going through that path and it was really just before I did that recording of the episode, I had gone through a really um, terrible cold and it lasted about two weeks. I'm asthmatic. And so at the time, I just remember like having lots of just like chest pain and yeah, a chest pain. And then also um, just just the lack of ability to breathe well, like it just it was very, very impactful for me. And I it wasn't because I was around anybody who had a cold like it was just stress upon stress upon stress that I had allowed to layer upon myself in my life and I didn't have an avenue to alleviate it. Um, and I recognized that. Uh, what's nice also is I had the opportunity to meet Brent. Um, Brent Darnell, who just spoke, I met him actually maybe about, mm, about a year 
prior to this episode. And then I saw him maybe just months before um, at the Lean Construction Institute Congress. And I had done the profile that he was just talking about, the Geist Emotional Intelligence Profile. And I pulled it out when I was sick. And I said, you know what? This is it. I'm not emotionally intelligent. <laughs> And it was interesting because I, I um, reviewed what he shared with me. I actually did the profile. I, I, I did that at the conference. This must have been in October. And he shared with me, I, wa I walked up to him and I said, you know, what do you think about my profile? It doesn't show that I'm, you know, doing anything crazy, right? And he, he looked at me dead in my face and he said, it looks like you're on the way to burnout. And I was like, no, not me. <laughs> No, not me. That's not me. I'm not, I didn't I didn't want to believe it. Also, what was really interesting, Sasha, you know, you mentioned it just doesn't happen to guys, right? Like it's about high performers. I, what came out in that test is that I had a little bit of a alpha uh, profile there where I felt as though I needed to be on top of every single thing and there was no room for failure. There was no room for give and take. I felt that I had to be on it every single second of the day. And uh, it didn't really matter who I barreled over. It, it was very much about me and what needed to happen for me in order to get whatever level of success I thought I needed to have at that time. Um, and that really was totally wrong. And I came to some, th some of those same realizations when I was evaluating that, uh, that profile. So in the episode, I shared a little bit about each one of those things. And I actually called Brent and I said, Brent, this is what I'm learning about myself. What do you think? And can you give me a couple thoughts and ideas and record them for me so I can include them in the podcast? Thankfully, Brent was, was uh, lovely enough to, to share his thoughts and ideas. And um, it's been a really interesting journey ever since. You know, I, I, I counted myself as a person who is um, healthy, uh, you know, eats really well and exercises well, but mental health has, can have such a huge impact on your physical, um, well-being and you know it, it just goes to show that you need to look at all areas of your life 100 percent. i think especially as a high performer and coming from the the data squad the nerd squad in construction like i really think there's a, a part of you that likes to hack the process, the, the ideas. And it's the same thing as a high performer. You're really looking for how do I perform best? And I think some of us are really on this journey of self-discovery and awareness, but you come smack up against that stigma when you try to have a conversation about it, or you're trying to figure out how do I talk about this? <laughs> what do I tell my boss? I, it, I mean, that's, these are really, really challenging questions, but I think, Brittany, what I love about you and your story is you are ever continuously evolving and improving, and you've not only recognized that um, acute awareness of your rushing, running to burnout, but you've taken on the mantle of incorporating it into how you understand yourself, how you engage in the industry, and as a thought leader, the conversations you're having. So thank you for your brave Thank you for being a champion. Thank you for letting us know you can you can figure it out, get through it, and still be a high performer, but not at the cost of your mental health. Yeah, I'm so happy to share. I'm 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 really glad that I um, can impact someone by sharing my story. So thank you for the opportunity. Oh, glad glad to have you. Uh, our next story, our next thought leader, I I, I want to bring into this conversation is Rick Khan. Um, wow. Uh, if you don't know Rick, you've been hiding under a rock or maybe you're new to the industry and we'll forgive you. Um, but Rick, uh, I wanted to bring in to share his story with you all. Um, Rick, you and I have known each other for years and yeah. uh, uh, I've followed your journey on social media, looking at how you've leveraged it as an industry influencer. Um, but I really wanted you to share your story with us today to get your perspective around the journey you've had um, with social media um, and your perspective, I think, is, is pretty sharp on whether it's helping or hurting us in having some of these crucial conversations 
Um, so I'd love for you to share a little bit of, about that journey uh, with us, but also your passion around, it's not just a challenge for field craft workers. This is really um, a, a problem with a lot of high performers in both industry, in technology, from the owner space. Um, so share with us a little bit around the journey that you've taken um, in, in kind of exploring uh, uh, your own uh, issues, um, challenges, and, and um, uh, exploration around mental health with us. Thanks so much for having me, Sasha. It's good to see you always. Um, I, uh, so I'll start about a little bit of background about myself. Um, I've um, battled with mental health challenges uh, since I was a teenager. Um, I'm, I have bipolar disorder one and um, struggled a lot with depression. Um, had multiple scenarios for, you know, suicide ideation over the years. And last year, you know, I, like for everyone, it was, it was a year that I hit rock bottom. And one of the things that was a contributing factor was the social media. I was so like involved in social media to get uh, the word out around innovation and how things are happening and the speed at which things are happening. Um, I was really focused before last year on just pushing information out, not necessarily, you know, reading comments and all that. But last year, I, I got sucked into that vortex of, you know, getting fed off these uh, or just feeding off these comments. And the, the pain and the, the negativity that was happening in the industry, not just here within the AEC space, but across the world. And I just couldn't take it anymore. I just hit this wall. And I had posted, I got rid of Twitter and I got rid of Facebook. And, you know, I, I had said I wasn't going to post on LinkedIn anymore. And um, it was really because I, I wasn't dealing with it. I wasn't dealing with you know, what my goal was and my objective by pushing information out there was to really inspire people. It was around, you know, educating, you know, around innovation and things that are happening, you know, understanding trending um, topics and sharing that with my network and at a larger scale. Um, so I took a break. I had basically shut everything off. I stopped reading the news. I stopped social media. And I started to focus on myself and, you know, I went through this long journey of joining, you know, intensive therapy group sessions and individual therapy. I, I feel like I've been in therapy my entire adult life. Um, but the reality is it's about growing and learning, right? Learning and growing. And uh, I think over the last year, what I, what shifted in me was getting back to my ultimate purpose of inspiring one person at a time. That's like my personal tagline. I love using that. Um, and, um, you know, I think over, you'll, you'll see a lot of my posts over the last couple of months. It's been about leadership. It's been about caring for people um, because people are the center of innovation. People are the center of everything we do. We are, you know, we are packed animals um, and we rely on society to actually survive. Um, and I think when I, when I went back into social media via LinkedIn, I haven't really used anything else. I said to myself, look, it's not about what people respond, but it's more important for me to give love and share love um, instead of fear, all right? Because there's two main feelings or uh, uh, forget, yeah, whatever, love and fear. So um, I really detached myself from the fear side of it and stop paying attention to that. And, and I actually, and started being more proactive, like blocking certain posts that were political in nature or hate in nature or fear-based. And, um, you know, that was, uh, that was a turning point for me because I realized by inspiring people, by sharing positive energy out there, you know, even though it may not come back right away, you know, it's something that is part of my, my, my objective, how I wanna live and being the authentic, being your authentic self. Because I think I struggle with that because I, I felt like I was isolated. People who suffer from mental challenges, mental health challenges usually feel isolated, usually feel like no one else is going through this but me. And I think um, 
what I learned in joining those group therapy sessions was there's so many other people that, you know, th those are my people, right? And, you know, we, we share so much and we can help each other and build a community. So not only am I building community in person with my group therapy, but also building community with social media. So that's kind of like my new take on it. <laughs> I've loved watching your return to social media and also um, even in your posts, which I can attest to, um, I have my own pathways or mantras I go through in the morning to get in the right mindset because for me, mindset is everything. Um, you're now on my list where I've, I've it added you from thought leadership around technology, innovation, people focus to now inspiration. So you're on two of my lists. So I'm... I'm, it's a pleasure to watch your journey. It's Thank also you. a pleasure as uh, somebody who knows you personally and professionally um, to see you participate in industry this way, honestly. Well, one of the things I, I would like to say is when I posted those things in social media saying, saying that I wasn't partaking in this process anymore, you know, Jeff reached out, Jeff Sample reached out to me, Rob McKinney, Josh Bone. There was a whole bunch of folks that reached out. I mean, Tasha, you and I talked and Nathan and I, and I think, you know, that was something that I missed when I got, a, you know, moved away from it. Um, and coming back to it, I just feel like building community is the most important thing we can do. Uh, uh, agree, completely agree. And this is uh, a big part of why we wanted to really make this a webinar is um, it, the more we can destigmatize the conversation, the more we find we can actually have the same, the same community we have through the technology evangelists and the data nerds and the construction uh, uh, professionals. The more we recognize and kind of uncover these stories, the more we see that community already exists with the people you're talking to. They just haven't felt safe to share. So. I, I'm glad that you're, you're helping to lead that in, in giving people permission to share. So thank you, Rick, so much. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. All right. So I fibbed earlier. I said we had three thought leaders, but you get a bonus. I was wrong. We have four. So we have two more um, industry thought leaders I really wanted to um, uh, allow to share their um, stories with you. And this story, um, Nick Maletta is... Uh, was gracious enough to join this conversation, um, is an expert in his own right, uh, working with Cal, but um, personally, uh, even in the uh, pre-interview conversation, shared some of his own um, challenges with imposter syndrome, which I, I know I've had many conversations with a lot of women in construction around this idea, but it doesn't seem to be gender specific. It seems to be human specific. So Nick, I really wanted to invite you to come in share a bit about your story and really looking at um, the courage to, uh, to not only look at yourself, understand yourself and understand uh, what some of the limitations are that you're experiencing, but really around how and when to communicate um, your mental health uh, illness history with your organization and tell us your story and your journey around discovering your own imposter syndrome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Sasha. I really appreciate that. Uh, thank you all for having me. This has been an amazing conversation so far, and I promise I won't take up too much time because I know we have a lot of great stuff left. So um, my background, so uh, I'm a coworker of Cal's. He and I had met about eight years ago and reconnected when he joined my organization about a year ago. And um, I've always kind of had this uh, interest and in, in, um, bewilderment with psychology and mental health and kind of how people act and interact. And so. Um, that curiosity connected to um, what I was doing on a day-to-day, -day, which is risk management for the AEC community, right? That's kind of what my role is. Um, and quite frankly, I was getting bored with it. And so I wanted to connect a passion that I had uh, for mental well-being to that community. So I started, started to spend time on, you know, the built environment and promoting physical and mental well-being within that environment, uh, which Cal and I uh, spent some time on. And and there's an article, link to an article that I wrote. Thank you for that. Um, but, you know, my, my personal story really goes back to something that Sasha mentioned about self-awareness. Um, you know, uh, about 2012, 2013, I went through a pretty traumatic personal experience that really made me step back and look at myself and who I was. And I realized after that traumatic experience, 
I didn't know who I was. And I think that's why I was so miserable. Um, and so I've spent every day since then trying to figure out who I am. Um, and I, and I mean that too, it is an everyday curiosity that I have. It's an everyday thing that I'm doing. And, and it's been mentioned by a couple of folks, uh, already, but you want to get better. You want to find the best self every day. Um, and so that's something that really drove me, um, back in 2017, um, I, I was uh, selected for a very high honor in my company. Uh, so very, some background for you. Um, we're a privately held company, employee owned. Um, we have about a thousand employees, but only about 120 owners. So being asked to be an owner is a really big deal for us um, and a big part of our sort of recruitment and retention uh, around the firm. So in 2017, I was asked to be an owner. Um, you know, keep in mind, I'm probably on the younger side of the, the panelists today. Um, and so I was, I was very young at this time. I was actually the youngest shareholder ever uh, when I bought in. Um, and really, you would look at this from the outside and say, you're, you're at the peak, you're at the pinnacle. Um, and it was, it was a very unique time for me because the entire time I went through my session, uh, that was sort of this training to be a shareholder session, everybody's celebrating, everybody's having a great time. And the whole time I'm sitting there thinking, why am I here? how did I get here? What, what makes me special, right? I, I didn't have a belief that I should be there. Um, and then I found myself doing that in a lot of different situations, maybe even a little bit today with this amazing group of panelists and myself. But um, the more and more I dug into it, the more and more you know, reading I did about self-awareness and training and education there, I stumbled across imposter syndrome. Um, imposter syndrome is kind of this idea of, you know, doubting your own abilities and really feeling like a fraud in a lot of different situations. Um, and I think it's been mentioned a couple of times, but a lot of times this is exhibited in high achieving individuals um, who don't quite trust their accomplishments and how they got to where they did. Um, and so that's something that I found uh, really did resonate with me. And it's something that I battle every day. And I was asked the other day, when did you get over that? Um, I haven't. Uh, I, I still experience it most every day. Um, but I think it's something that I try to look at as an ability to grow and to learn. You know, every time you get out of that comfort zone, that's really where your growth occurs, at least in my opinion. And so if I'm in a situation where I feel like I'm having an imposter moment, I just need to tell myself, you know what, this is where you're growing. This is where you're learning. Not everyone is, is ready for this when they're asked to do these things, but this is what happens, right? Um, so that's, that's really you know, my, my story and, and why, what I wanted to share. Obviously, there's a, a multitude of other things that I struggle with mentally, um, but I think that's a big one that has resonated with quite a few because I think a lot of people are afraid to talk about that one um, because it kind of outs you as you don't think you should be here, right? So, um, one other point I wanted to make too, uh, just for those who have people that report to them and that, that sort of thing that have different generations, um, just know that the younger generation is very ready to have these conversations. Um, I think it's a very unique trait. The younger the generations are getting, the more ability they have or willingness they have to be vulnerable. Um, so don't be afraid to have these conversations um, because I can tell you from my own experience, the more that I have them, the more rewards that I get back. Um, so I wanted to make one more quick point. I, I, there was a question in the chat about meditation. And somebody had asked, can you speak to meditation? I know we're gonna do questions, um, but I, I was never a believer in this. And so I wanted to uh, do a quick shout out. For me, meditation is all about finding what fits you, right? Um, Sasha, you mentioned your mindset and kind of the pathways that you have every day. Um, you know, some people use apps and things like that. I was never a believer, but found a couple apps that I love and changed my world. Um, and then I also found that it has to be done at the right time for you. So for me, I'm in the car a lot, traveling from you know, client to client. Um, and that car windshield time is really where it happens for me. And a lot of times I just have to remember that and, and build that up. Um, Bianca is mentioning Syncturition. That's the one that changed my life. Um, so if you guys haven't heard of that, that's a big thing for me. I just wanted to speak to that meditation piece before I forgot. So thank you guys so much for having me. Uh, this has been awesome. Uh, thank you, Nick. I think I think the more we talk about it, the, the more we start to recognize that this is just a part of neuro 
neurological performance. This is how our brains work. What's never been done before is really bringing to a level of awareness of understanding that this is how the brain works and a, a, such a high level of understanding of um, this is normal. <laughs> Therefore, you can recognize, drop all the judgment on yourself um, and go from fight or flight mode to making sense of the emotion, getting to a space to observe the emotion, uh, which we haven't necessarily had from a social construct, the space to talk about this without the stigma. But I truly believe this is that fourth wall we're breaking <laughs> in having the conversation with each other in order to have better conversations with ourselves. So thank you so much for what you shared. And I think it, it's now a nice segue to our, our fourth thought leader that I want to bring in, Jeff Sample. Jeff, oh my gosh, I literally remember the, the day we met over text. <laughs> I think I was driving, moving from California to Texas and got a text from you and started a conversation. Um, I'm a huge admirer of you, what you do. You are the Iron Man of IT. So I think it's fitting we kind of um, uh, kind of anchor this conversation around personal perspectives with you. Uh, let's let's kind of look at this then through what if we do have, how do we create environments within our work environments where there is there is that safety? to start to have those conversations, to break that fourth wall of having conversations with each other in order to improve the conversations with ourselves. Um, tell, tell us a little bit about your story and how transparency uh, about your state of mind and where you're at, how that plays into your current work. All right, well, thank you. I remember that conversation as well, Sasha. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I'm gonna apologize because normally before I go on, I do a couple of meditation techniques and whatnot to put the mask on. So I, I've been talking to Chad Pearson on, on text over here and he's been encouraging me not to put the mask on. So um, in the interest of transparency, the mask is not on today. And it's I'm scared to death right now, which is not something I ever really admit, let's be honest. Um, because I, like Nick talked about, I, I suffered deathly from, from imposter syndrome and, and there's a moment in time in which you have to, I think, kind of go past it and push through it. And so today's going to be the day that I, I, I try to do this. So I, I'm sorry, I'm already losing it, but, um, I, I want to think back to a couple of years back with, with Cal Byer, uh, Cal has had such an influence in my life and I, I don't know that he knew it. Um, in fact, I, well, I do know he knew it. Um, we sat on at the, at the Fountain Blue at the CFMA and, uh, we were on a, we were on a, um, a podcast with James Benham and we were talking about the, um, the, uh, CIA SP and prevent construction suicide. And in the middle of the conversation, Cal turned and looked at me and said, you get it. And I said, yeah, I, I, I do, Cal, I get it. Because what he knew there that nobody else knew, that nobody else could see, that nobody else around me could see at the time was I have suffered with this. Uh, um, I have faced suicide in the face myself. Um, and it's, a, it's hard to admit, it's hard to talk about. But um, you talk about the rise to what we are and who we are, it's, it's still really freaks me out to be called a thought leader, to be in the same sentence as a Rick Kahn or a Sasha Reed or, or a Cal Byer or any of you, uh, because I don't consider myself to be that. Um, because while all that was happening, everything was happening, everything blew up at once. That conversation with Sasha and Nathan took me on an incredible ride that I love. Um, but I was just a little IT guy who was an IT director that thought he knew a thing or two or might be able to offer a thing or two. And then all of a sudden, these wonderful people started listening and started feeding back and started to, to help me out. But while all that was going on, what nobody knew was I was dealing with a, a failed marriage, a, a, a dissolution of my life, everything. I know Kelly Doyle's on the phone uh, or on the call as well. And, and even Kelly can probably attest he didn't know what was going on until I showed up in a Zoom meeting with a bed in the background that he'd never seen before. Because I was hiding all of that from all of them. Because I was afraid they'd all know that this person is scared, can't believe or understand how anyone would want to listen or, or even follow along with what I had to say. And um, 
But it's time, and I told Cal that there's far more to this story, and I, and and I've promised Cal someday I'll I'll have the guts to like really sit down and talk about the whole thing uh, from tip to tail. But it's going to take a lot of time and and some trust because what what Sasha you're talking about is um, I've had the opportunity to admit to this before, and um, when I did, it was held against me. So um, I admitted to um, thoughts of suicide and actually sitting across from a bottle of pills. And um, the only thing that saved me was little footsteps coming down the, down the stairs, and it was my daughter. And um, in a, what I thought was a safe space with therapists and others, I, I admitted to this, and then later it was held against me. And so since I've drawn back in and, and been afraid, uh, to ever admit to it again, but I didn't not seek help. I went out and got help. Uh, I've been with different therapists on different things, worked on meditation, worked on those things to, to believe that I'm truly here for a reason to, to help people out and to share it and to have the guts to, to say, no, it, it, it hasn't. But what I wanted to talk about here today was that, um, you know, while you're going through that and, and, um, uh, I was reading a book recently that talked about, you know, all of us have this, this part inside of us that's all smoky and covered that you can't see. And you're walking around and wandering around in there sometimes, and then you bump into a, a jagged edge that gets you. Well, over this last few months, we've all been, you know, locked up with, with this. And for an extrovert who's opposite of a lot of you that we're talking, I live and breathe to be with y'all. And um, so... I was ready and raring. One of my coworkers said, you're, you're going to go back full bore, aren't you? Well, I went back full bore about a month ago and I walked into a bunch of those jagged edges, re-entering into the society and, and not understanding the fears and what re-entry anxiety was. And a lot of these feelings and things that, that came up from the past have come back up. Um, and it cost me another relationship in my life. And that's, that's something we all, it's hard to admit to, it's hard to talk about. So um, that's, that's where I am right now on this process. And, and, and I don't know, I mean, I have a few other things, but, um, you know, there's this talk of like uh, imposter syndrome and how, and how it can affect us. And, and we think that giving people this positive feedback of, you know, you inspire, you do these things. And, and for me, the hardest part about that is that then I have to go and live up and I force myself to believe that I have to go and live up to this positive feedback that you get. Um, and it drives a cycle. I was watching Chad with his, you know, the things he was putting up and those are like, such incredible techniques that we need to, to use and grasp. And, um, it, it, it it's crazy because the success breeds more of the fear of failure. Um, and the fear that you don't deserve to be here. So I think I'm rambling at this point. So I'm going to slow down. <laughs> I think you're speaking our feelings. <laughs> I hope you're reading the chat box, by the way. I, I can't. I can't look at it at the moment. I'm sorry. I cannot read this. Showers of love. Um, I, I will say, I will say, Jeff, I think that um, no one goes to this life unscathed um, and no one gets to greatness without deep depths. So the the reality here is um, there's always work to internal work to be done. And um, the loudness of the, that internal voice in your head uh, an imposter syndrome is as loud as the work to be done, but it's not impossible to continue to do that work in order to, um, to, to lessen that critic, that self critic, um, which all of us have. So for, what you're sharing around the accolades and hearing the all the positive uh, feedback um, is in is in direct relation to um, your ability to use grit to push through. Only now to really look at from a great perspective, asking for help. That's really truly, I think, <laughs> what's the takeaway from this is that being able to ask for the help when we need it, um, which is a powerful, powerful story. 
So thank, thank you. And I guess my other my other thing for those listening to, and I said this in the in the pre call, and it's something I wrote down that I wanted to talk about is there is many of us have the ability, and and I'm I'm fairly sure that most of you, if you've seen me or been out in on the road, wouldn't know these things were going on. We have the ability to put that mask on. Um, so watch for the other things. It's people like Cal and others that can see through the mask that um, inspires me. And I think I can see through the mask at times and, and reach out for people. So do that. And um, it's okay to take the mask off. It's burned me a few times, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to stop, especially because of the great people like Brent Darnell and, and Cal Byer. Cal's always been there for me um, to pick up the phone. I don't, know that he even knows a few times when I called him how low I was and how much just a conversation with someone like that brings you back up. So no matter how many times you get kicked when you're down, get back up. And, um, and thanks to the CPC for having the guts to have this conversation because it's brought people like me out and Rick out to say, you know, it's important to talk about and nobody is an Iron Man. Uh, I will tell you now the Iron Man of IT is a person that I play on a microphone for a role, but it is not who I am. And we can't continue that. Oh, powerful words, honest conversation. So Jeff, um, I think I speak for everyone. I say thank you. And you're definitely not alone in this. You will want to watch this back and read the chats when you have a moment. <laughs> I'll get there. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I whew. I'm going to take a cleansing breath because I felt all of that courage that it took for Jeff to have that conversation and with us. I'm, I'm going to come back in now because somehow I feel better all of a sudden. The headache and all this stuff, you know, all this, uh, I don't know what brain drug, uh, Chad, you'll have to tell me. But no, I think if uh, anyone that w wants to bring their uh, cameras on, I know we got feedback that uh, it was distracting to have too many cameras on. So we were in innovating on the fly here. But uh, if we want to bring folks back and um, spend a little bit of time just uh, some final thoughts and there's some great questions there that I think Cal maybe we should start with the the question there that was asked by Dana and some of your responses there on um, what people can do to move forward um, and then uh, and then we'll, we'll move into this uh, external internal stuff if you're there Cal yes Nathan um, I really appreciate Darren Young he had a response to Dana's question about additional training and resources and <clears throat> Darren is someone I'm uh, just getting acquainted with, but I've seen his uh, thought leadership. And he responded, it's not about doing anything other than just being there. Being present is one of the most powerful gifts we can give someone else. And we get so much more back when we are present and we make ourselves vulnerable and we share our stories. I was just uh, typing a note as well. I buried my stories for years. Um, when I worked in healthcare through high school and college, it probably saved my life. And um, for years, I was afraid if I told my story that it would uh, damage the cause. So I kind of uh, really admire the number of people sharing lived experience in so many forms and fashions. And each of you are leaders and each of you are people that are opening the path for others. So Dana uh, asked a question about resources and uh, one, the Center for Workplace Mental Health, that's where Darcy Grudadero works. She developed an online training module for managers and supervisors, and it's called Notice, Talk, Act at Work. It's about 35 minutes online e-module. It's really focused with a great resource guide. The second um, resource, Nathan, that I offered was National Alliance on Mental Illness, NAMI, does a great job normalizing mental illness and really promotes an understanding of diseases of the brain. And what's powerful, there are people with mental illnesses, diagnosed mental health conditions, who are more mentally healthy than people without those diagnosed mental health conditions and all the coping strategies, all the skills, all the resources from stress management, mindfulness, meditation, nutrition, proper hydration, 
exercise, nature walks, the things that were discussed by all the panelists today are the things that can promote mental health, health and, and wellness. Um, so I just wanted to quickly uh, state those things. Uh, deep admiration, Nathan, for you and the CPC for opening Pandora's box. The lid is off and we'll never get this genie back in the bottle. And um, a deep appreciation and respect for everyone. Sasha, great job. Bianca, all your stuff behind the scenes, uh, providing links. Uh, this was a total team effort and um, hats off to everyone. <clears throat> Agreed. And, and, you know, I, I think we definitely covered that, that core question that we wanted to address of, you know, how do we develop that, that culture of safety? What are the resources? The, the other one that I, I want to make sure that we do touch before we depart is um, on those, those internal and external in influences. And, and as we just discussed, there's so many things that we don't see, but there, there are things that we do see and, and kind of how do we interact to those um, different aspects. And I, I know, uh, Jim, you've been, you've been quiet and I'll, I'll turn your, uh, your camera back on here. Um, to maybe share a little bit of, of your perspective on all this again, because construction is is a uh, new right from uh, your your side of the world, and uh, just kind of what what you've learned and reflection from this conversation. Sure. Well, thank you for that. I, you know, it's interesting to have me in the construction industry. You wouldn't even expect it because something that probably hardly anybody on this session knows is that I'm legally blind. I actually was born completely blind. I've had six surgeries to remove cataracts from both eyes, but I'm still considered legally blind. I've worked as a facilitator for decades and a motivational speaker. And when I came on board at the UBC, one of the things that happened was people said, well, wait a second, you're legally blind and you're gonna be talking to all these construction workers. And that actually brought into my own brain some self-doubt because I thought, wait a second, they're right. I can't do the work these guys and, and women do. And so how am I going to have any opportunity to really have an impact here? And then I started examining kind of my own inner thoughts. People talked about EQ or emotional intelligence on this call. With emotional intelligence, my self-regulation, what I choose to say was a kind of a low score, but it wasn't because of my self-regulation toward other people. It was my self-regulation toward myself. And I would just bash myself that, hey, you're not, you, you can't be up here with these folks. You don't belong in that setting and things like that. And what I've realized is that there are internal and external limitations that we each face, but they're not real limitations. They're perceived limitations. So for example, a perceived limitation that's internal for me as well, I can't drive. So I guess that means I can't go anywhere. Well, that's not really true. I put that limitation within myself, but I could take a cab or an Uber or have a friend drive me someplace or a family member or whatever. So I only limit myself through what I thought. And then there's external limitations, things like fear, which most people would assume is an internal, but it's actually external because it's something outside of yourself that scares you to the point that you can't move physically in life or mentally or emotionally in life, you can't even move. And I have an example. I was at the Grand Canyon teaching a class for some of the folks up there. And one evening I'm walking back from a grocery store at the Canyon and in front of me at sunset is this massive something or other on the path. And I heard a grunt and put the silhouette and the grunt together and realized it was an elk <laughs> and the elk his back was probably taller than me and I'm not even six foot. So oh it froze me right there where I stood. And I think it's an awesome example of what happens to us in life that something outside of ourselves can cause us to just stop in our tracks, examine what's going on and go, you know, there's nothing I can do here. But yet if you can get into your own emotional intelligence and things that were talked about like this earlier, I tried to just be calm and really quiet and hope it didn't notice me. And I slowly backed up till I got to the pavement. And then I ran like crazy, <laughs> get away from it. And thankfully I'm here to talk about it and everything's okay. But I think that in life, we all experience either internal or external limit, perceived limitations that keep us from pursuing what we want or know we can pursue. And it just, it becomes more of a challenge 
And so the whole premise even of look where you are, see where you're going, was me coming off a plane. And I walked out the jetway and it was an unfamiliar place to me. So I stopped where I was and literally moved out of the way so the people behind me didn't run me over. And I had to figure out where I was in that airport so I knew where I could go forward from there. And that's kind of takes me through life on that same philosophy. And that's what I can say about internal and external perceived limitations. Ugh. So many, so many layers. If only we had another hour and a half to talk, right, Sasha? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. I mean, I mean, I can stick around. Uh, now, now I'm, I'm full of energy now. But uh, anytime, yeah. I'd be well. I, I'd welcome the opportunity anytime. Uh, I, I mean, yeah. Certainly, if there are more questions, thoughts, folks that that, that want to talk, I think Sasha, maybe any closing thoughts for you, and and obviously a, a thanks to all of our uh, powerful and and amazing and and vulnerable uh, participants that that shared here. Yeah, just again, I echo the same. Thank you, and uh, I think we've we've started something. So congratulations to the courage represented because we've started something with an um, amazing tool set to. Um, guide our conversations from this webinar so I'm, I'm grateful for each of you thank you thank you absolutely and and you know i think because Dar darren brought it up here um in the chat that this is something that personally i i suffer with uh, you know my fear of saying the wrong thing forces me to not say anything at all yeah. and it's like that's not the right answer either right and I, I know either Cal or Jim have a good answer to that because I think we, that we should have a good answer to that question. I don't want to let that un, unsaid. Cal, if you'd like yeah, to say something. To, to me, it is about being present and it is letting that person know you're there. There was something on social media this week where someone posted a saying, I'm here. And it was a calming, soothing, a person knows that Someone cares about me. Someone sees me. Um, I think it's a powerful uh, statement that Darren has made. And um, there's a lot of really great comments, Nathan. I know you're going to capture it like usual, but there'll be so many things. Someone used that term toxic positivity. But I think maintaining that sense of optimism and uh, sharing that, smiling, um, the power of touch. If you feel comfortable and um, it's appropriate, putting a hand on someone's shoulder, uh, on their elbow, just letting them know that uh, I'm here, I'm, I'm prepared to comfort you. And there's so many good skills, techniques, living works training. Um, American Foundation for Suicide Prevention has a program called Talk Saves Lives. There's so many tools in our toolbox. We'll continue to share. Uh, your group has done an incredible job. What a great service to the whole industry. And talk about uh, your theme, shared pains for shared gains. Um, if, this is a great testimony, right? If I can share just a quick thought on the being afraid of saying something or the wrong thing and then just choosing not to say anything. Sometimes rather than saying something, just ask something. Just ask a question. Ask the person to talk a little more about what's going on with them. And even if it's not the meat of what's actually going on with them, just ask them a question, get them to talk. Cause we don't have to have all the answers instantaneously. And so sometimes it's more about listening than it is about what we say. Absolutely. What, one last thing you brought up Cal on the toxic positivity. Simon Sinek uh, taught me the difference between po positivity and optimism. And that, you know, the positivity is kind of that, that grit, that burnout, that just tell yourself it'll be okay in the short term with no understanding of the long term. Whereas optimism recognizes that the short term may suck, but the long term will always be better. That, that the, you know, the other side of the, the grass is always greener, I guess. Um, but there, so much of that just comes down to your own mindset and how you come into these situations that can, can really impact your entire life. So on that note, um, we will definitely be doing more of these conversations. Uh, a ton of resources got shared in the chat uh, that will be shared out and all these resources will be shared with everyone in the, the follow-up email. Um, thank you all for sharing this, for memorializing this conversation. It was recorded. We, we will be publishing. We, we didn't used to do this when we first started these because they were so sensitive, but now we recognize that, that sharing it is 
part of this. So thank you all for for being honest and and sharing your stories. Um, and and check the construction progress uh, YouTube channel for those when they get posted. And uh, we will be um, looking to to definitely have a mental health uh, breakout on our next uh, group of um, multiple break breakouts. So it'll be again back to our normal Zoom breakout rooms. Everyone's cameras on and ready to rock in uh, multiple different technical and social topics on October 20th. Um, so uh, without further ado, uh, thank you, Sasha, so much. Uh, I, I don't know how you do what you do <laughs> the time that you have. You're amazing. And, and thank you to everyone um, and, and all, all the great questions and conversation that came in. It was uh, very, very interactive um, and structured. So thank you all. Thank you, Nathan, for your leadership. Thank, Thank you, so you much. Sasha. We'll <laughs> talk soon.